Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Today I'm giving a brief guide on how to fill in a VFR flight log if you're planning a VFR flight, um, particularly in UK airspace. We're using the CAA chart, uh, CAA half mil southern chart. Uh, it's quite out of date, so so don't don't be too concerned if some of the details on on my chart don't match your own. But uh, it will, it's just more for the specifics of of the, the actual filling in of the log and the flight planning process rather than the details involved uh, on this particular chart. This should be uh, hopefully useful for anyone who's doing a PPL course at the moment, uh, planning their cross country qualifier, doing any navexes, or even for a GA pilot who's uh, want, wanting to brush up. Um, refresh themselves on some of the processes involved. Uh, I'm certainly no expert. I'm just a GA pilot myself, so I, I, you know I don't have any commercial experience, and I'm I'm not a flight instructor by any means. But hopefully uh, you'll find it useful, and, and if there's any hints and tips that you can feedback, then I'll incorporate them in the next video. So on we go. The VFR flight log gives you all your legs that you need to plan. So where you're going to fly from and to. And you can be as detailed or as vague as you like really with that. It's entirely up to you. So you can just put from and to a straight line from your departure to your destination. You can have some turning points on the way. Uh, or you can even break down straight legs into into level changes as well. So uh, you can you can plan uh, a climb. So from uh, your bottom of your climb to your top of your climb. You know, your airspeed might change and so that will affect the time and that will affect how much fuel you use because of the power you've got set. So um, if you've got, if you're in an aircraft and you're going to climb 10,000 feet, then it might be worth doing uh, a leg that is solely um, involved involved in that level change, even though it might be in exactly the same direction as, as, the, pre as the previous leg or it might be just a small part of a very long straight leg. Um, it might be significant enough and it might affect your time and your fuel, so it might be good practice. Uh, once we worked out how long we're going to be flying for on this leg, we know how much fuel we're going to use, um, we can, or we know how much time we're going to take, we can then work out how much fuel we're going to use and we're going to look at the de details of the fuel planning a bit later on. And then finally, once we know how much fuel we're going to use, uh, we can convert that to a weight added to all the rest of the weight that we're going to we're going to be carrying on board and we're going to put that into our mass and balance calculations to make sure that we we are safe to go and uh, carry out the flight. So first things first then let's have a look at this particular uh, single leg that we're going to plan today. We don't need to know where we're going from and to and we don't need to know our actual time of arrival so I've just removed them at the moment. Um, they don't require any calculation that, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, we, we already know those details of where we're going from and to and uh, our actual time of arrival will be written down later. We, we don't need to, we can't calculate it, we just, we're just going to read it off our watch when we arrive. So let's have a look at these details in particular. There are three different sections that we're going to look at. There are chart sections. And these are, as, as described, you're going to get your map out and these are items of information that you're going to work out just using your chart. Um, I think it's probably easy to do the things like that first because, you know, that's that's the basis for everything really. You're going to, it feeds into everything else. Once we've done our chart items, we're going to get our flight computer out and uh, we're going to have a look at the, the elements of our leg that require a little bit of flight computer calculation. And again, if you can try and crack all of those at the same time, I mean, some of them will come together anyway, but if you can try and crack those at the same time, um, then it saves you just flipping to and from, you know, your chart back to your flight computer, back to your chart, and it'll just make things a little bit more efficient. And then finally, you've got a little bit of housekeeping to do, um, and this is the nice, easy part. This is where you just tie up any loose ends. Normally involves uh, just looking things up. Um, no great... Uh, thought processes involved in terms of calculating or measuring or anything like that. So how do these uh, how do these affect each other? Well, some some of these elements depend on one or more uh, of the other elements. So you know it, you can't work out the ground speed without first working out your true air speed, for example. And that's what we're going to look at here. So your minimum safe altitude may or may not affect your planned altitude. All your minimum safe altitude there is there to do is to say if you get into a bit of of uh, hazy weather, poor visibility, or you know you inadvertently enter IMC or, or whatever, um, what is your minimum height that you're safe to fly at? That's just that's just your your buffer there really. It's there to sit in the background, 
and use it in an emergency if you need to. Um, certainly don't take it as a as a hard deck for your flight because we are flying VFR, so you can fly you can fly below the minimum safe altitude if you want to. The only real limitations that you're bound by are things like airspace restrictions, um, you know, danger zones, uh, traffic zones, uh, stuff like that. But also the the air navigation order. So make sure that you comply with the low flying rules. Uh, 500 feet from any person, vehicle, vessel, or structure, the land clear if you're over a, a congested area, all those things you should be uh, totally familiar with. So that that's your main and first point of call when you're deciding uh, how low you're going to fly in particular. When you're looking at how high you're going to fly, then you, you're looking at ceilings above you, and that's normally going to be controlled airspace of any kind. Uh, primarily, obviously, you're going to look at whether your aircraft is capable or you're capable and equipped to fly at that height. So, you know, you certainly wouldn't think, oh, there's no controlled airspace above me. I'm going to climb up to flight level 240 in my pit special because, A, you'll never get there. And in the miraculous event that you did, you'd probably be unconscious by the time you got halfway there. So, our primarily, you know, our primary ceiling is probably going to be based on um, controlled airspace above us. So next thing we're going to look at our true airspeed, which is going to be gleaned from our indicated airspeed, and we will come on to that, and then that's going to feed into our ground speed. But our ground speed is also going to be affected by the wind. So that's got that's got two inputs that we need there. Our true track is going to determine our our true heading. So our true track, which is our our track over the ground, our in re in relation to the geographic North Pole. Um, and that's going to determine where we point in relation to the geographic North Pole, where we point our aircraft. Um, but where we point our aircraft in relation to the geographic North Pole isn't the same as where we point our aircraft in relation to the magnetic North Pole. So once once we know the former, though, uh, we can work out the latter. And just, just showing you there that wind velocity is obviously also going to come into play in relation to our true heading. In order to work out our time, we need our speed and distance to do a, a quick speed distance time calculation. And then finally, uh, what time are we going to arrive at our destination? Well, that depends on what time we start. But um, once we know how long it's going to take us, uh, it's fairly straightforward to work that out, as you can imagine. I prefer to tackle these in a particular order, but it's it's by no means laid down in concrete. If you find a better way or a way that works for you, then you know go for that. Why wouldn't you? First thing for me then is get the map out and we're going to work out how far is it from A to B. So let's have a look at the chart. We're going from Shoreham today to Lashenden, so there's our line. Uh, how far is it? We're going to get our flight ruler out and make sure that you are using the right side of the flight ruler because they normally uh, have a, a quarter mil um, graduations on one side and half mil graduations on the other. So we're using a CAA Southern half mil chart, so make sure that you've got the half mil graduations. Uh, and you will find that the distance from Shoreham to Lashenden is 40 miles, probably plus a quarter of a mile or so, but 40 miles will we'll make it today. So we're going to pop that into our distance table. Next thing we're going to find out while we've got the map out is our true track. And for that we're going to use our protractor, get back to the map. And we're going to find the halfway point of our line. What's the reason for finding the halfway point? Well, the CIA Southern chart uses the Lambert conformal conic projection. And one of the features of that is if you draw a straight line, it's a great circle. So it's the shortest distance between both points, but it's not necessarily a distance. Uh, it's not necessarily a line of constant bearing unless you're flying on the equator, for example, or unless you're flying uh, north-south. So, the best way to find out uh, your your average heading, if you like, is to work out the halfway point. So, it's going to give you a heading between your start heading and your, your last heading. Now, okay, I know you're probably saying that for, for a distance of 40 miles, it, it really makes no difference whatsoever. And you are right. But I think if you... If you can stick to the to the best practice, then you're not going to fall down any potholes later on if you do move to, to bigger charts. Uh, I think anything less than 500 miles and and you can measure anywhere on that line and it wouldn't make a difference. The, the great circle changes in heading only come into effect if you're planning legs of over 500 miles. 
Now the other type of chart that you can get is, the, is a, a transverse Mercator projection and the key feature of that is that every uh, the straight line that you draw is a rum line so that that particular straight line on a transverse Mercator will will be a line of constant bearing it will cross every line of longitude at the same angle so you don't need to you don't need to worry about where you measure your your um your bearing from you can measure from the start you can measure uh, at the finish it, it doesn't make any difference but uh worth noting that the the rum line isn't the uh the shortest distance between two points again over a, a distance of 40 miles it's never ever going to become a factor in our flight planning interesting to know though so we've put our we've put our central uh, midpoint there on our line and we're going to bring in our protractor Hopefully yours is transparent. Uh, the picture I, I found isn't, so you know we can't see the line underneath. But we can look at the right-hand side and see that it pops out at about 0, 0.61 degrees. And then we can go back to our table and pop pop that in. That's our true track over the ground relative to true north. So now we're, g we're going to look at our chart still and work out what's our minimum safe altitude over that over that leg. And that may or may not affect what our planned altitude is. We'll talk about that in a second. So to work out our minimum safe altitude, we're going to isolate five nautical miles either side of every point we expect to be. So there's that. Let's let's bring that out to the front. And now we're going to look for some particular spot heights or obstructions that exist within that zone. So I can see underneath uh, underneath our track there, we've got a spot, a geographical spot height that is 813 feet above mean sea level. So that could be a feature that comes into play. Um, but actually, you know, looking a bit further along our track, just to the right there, there's a an obstruction, a mast, and that's 1,007 feet above mean sea level. <coughs> or 489 feet above the ground, if you like. So it seems obvious which one we're going to use. We're, today we're going to use the obstruction on the right because uh, that's the highest of the two. But I think it is worth pointing out it's a couple of uh, little pitfalls that you can you can fall into here. Um, the charts may specify uh, a minimum elevation of, of terrain that it's going to show. So if you're flying over a particularly uh, low lying and level flat area and you can't find any spot heights or any obstructions on the ground, uh, if your chart legend may say that it doesn't show any obstructions, for example, below 200 feet so you could have a spot height of 199 feet that isn't shown so if you've got no obstructions or spot heights you're gonna have to consider what's my invisible spot height if you like what's my maximum spot height that I'm not gonna be allowed to see and for the example I've just used it's 199 feet just for that example and your chart could also have a minimum obstruction height that it's not gonna show anything below either so uh, again, for example, I'm going to say your minimum obstruction height is 300 feet. So if there's an obstruction that's 299 feet, it's not going to be shown. So if you're flying over a really flat, bland area with no obstructions or spot heights, just for the example I've, I've just spoken about with, with those uh, made-up arbitrary figures, you could have a spot height of uh, two, uh, 199 feet, and you could have an obstruction on that of uh, th uh, 299 feet. And so you need to round those up and, and accept that there could be something there that's up to 500 feet high. And you won't see it. So with that in mind, you're going to now add your 1,000 foot buffer on top of that. And that's going to take you to 1,500 feet in that case. So even in the most low-lying level vacant bland areas you know in that example where our minimum safe altitude is 1500 feet to guarantee us above to guarantee us a thousand feet separation above any invisible terrain and obstructions that could be on that terrain uh, i've looked on the caa chart and I, and I can't find any of those invisible um uh, spot heights or obstructions let me know if you can see it. i i certainly can't so we'll say for the purposes of today that there aren't any so looking at the two of these then i'm going to say that the spot height is irrelevant because um, there is no invisible obstruction on top of it that could take it above the height of the of the obstruction on the right we'll say that that's uh, nice and safe but if that was if the if the spot height on the left 
was our highest point in that in that zone that we've identified <clears throat> then what we would do is we'd round it up to the nearest 100 feet don't need to worry about the minimum obstruction height we've just cancelled that out and then we'd add a thousand feet on top of that so if, if that was our if that was the case we would have a msa of 1900 feet for that for that particular geographic point but as the obstruction is higher than that we're going to take that as our dangerous point on the way so we're going to simply round that up to the nearest hundred feet and add a thousand feet there are no there are no um, hidden terms and conditions when it comes to uh, an obstruction on your chart it is what it is there's nothing extra that's added on that that's unseen your highest obstruction is uh, is your highest point and, and that's all there is to it you know short of any no terms i suppose um, so today we're going to round up our 1,007 to the nearest 100, which takes it to 1,100, and then we're going to add 1,000, and we'll find that our MSA today is 2,100 feet. So we know we know what our safest, um, we know how low we can go to be safe if the weather gets a little bit a little bit uh, bad. But what about our maximum level? Let's have a look at our chart then. When it comes to our maximum level, as we've already said, we're, we're prim primarily concerned with uh, our aircraft and our own personal performance. Um, and we're looking at things like airspace as well. And I think airspace is going to be the key on today's flight. We can see that we've got a boundary there. And that gives us a ceiling of 3,500 feet up to the London TMA. Um, but actually, if we look a little bit closer, there's a second boundary there and that's that stops down to 2,500 feet so if we go above uh, 2,000 feet or certainly 2,400 feet if you like um, then we're going to be infringing that portion of airspace right there and London TMA are going to be looking to file on us and, and get us into all kinds of trouble so we don't want to do that we want to fly below those uh, portions of airspace and the 2,500 feet portion is our limiting factor so today I suppose for that flight, you know, you probably look at fly at 2,000 feet, maybe 2,400 feet, and if you're particularly brave, 2,450 feet, as long as you're on the right pressure setting, obviously. Well, just for the purposes of to make the calculations a little bit more interesting later on, I'm going to choose to ignore those portions of airspace for today, um, just just purely for um, calculating purposes. So in reality definitely do not ignore those portions of airspace whatever you do unless you've got uh, clearance to fly in class a airspace and all the necessary qualifications and equipment and things so i'm planning to fly today at flight level five zero so there's our msa and we're going to go at flight level five zero which is incidentally in accordance with the right quadrant for that for that section so next thing we're going to look at is the wind velocity and to do that we need to it's a lookup item so we're going to go online and i go to the met office and uh, they've got a particular aviation section so y you need to log in i don't think it, it costs anything unless you pay for the for extra features uh, but as a ga pilot i think you can register for free and log in and have a look at these two forms the one on the left is the met form 214 and that gives us our spot heights over a forecast period and it uh, tells us what our temperatures are at certain heights and the one on the right is the form 215 and that's going to uh, tell us uh, roughly what the weather's doing in certain zones throughout the course of the forecast period ahead so just make sure that you do get the right period for the one you're flying and you don't want to use out-of-date weather information because it's going to knock all your calculations out so on the left hand side the form 214 we're on the south coast of england and i've chosen to pick this particular uh, box of weather data as the one for our calculations so let's bring that one into view flight level five zero five thousand feet and the winds looking to be from the west two nine zero at twenty five knots and we will note there that the outside air at that height is plus two degrees so there's no way for us to put that on our on our flight log but we do need that for the true airspeed so we'll bear that in mind plus two degrees so wind velocity goes in there and next we're going to look at our true airspeed while well, we've got that figure of two degrees in our mind and we'll head uh, back to the whiz wheel in a second but first of all how do we get to true airspeed well the indicated airspeed is what we read off the dial and for for the flight i'm planning i'm gonna i'm gonna simulate we're using a pa28 of, and it's got a cruise speed of 120 knots so the indicated airspeed that i'm looking at 
from the dial in the cockpit is subject to a couple of errors and we need to correct for instrument and position error now instrument error is is inherent with the with the instrument with the pressure head and the manufacturers will try and reduce that as much as possible so there's not much we can do about that and the position error comes into play at unusual angles of attack so if if your pressure head is not pointing directly into wind or you're doing some high energy or aggressive maneuvers you're going to start getting uh, quite big discrepancies in your indicated airspeed and between what your true airspeed is so as we're not planning on you know barrel rolling our way from Shoreham to Lashenden today we, we don't need to worry about those two those two errors but if you did want to correct for position error there should be a table in your tech log that says or your flight manual that says um, exactly uh, at what point the error will be at, at its greatest you know what speeds or attitudes the, the position error will be at its greatest we're going to say for, t for the purpose of today and it, to be honest for the purpose of um, our GA flights in general we can ignore uh, instrument and position error so we can take our indicated airspeed to be rectified or calibrated airspeed now they're subject to a further error which is um, our density error and that's what we're going to correct for using the flight computer that is something that does need to be corrected for not not a problem for our GA pilots further down the line but if you're flying a fast high performance aircraft anything over 250 knots and you need to correct for compressibility error and you do that on the other side of the of the flight computer so once you've worked out your true airspeed again you're going to go back to your your flight manual or your your specific aircraft technical specifications and that's going to give you a table that gives you a factor to to correct again for your compressibility er error but as we're flying a GA aircraft a PA-28 um, 250 knots seems a long way away really so we're not going to worry about that we're going to take our indicated airspeed as our rectified airspeed and then we're going to put that into our flight computer and we're going to get our our true airspeed out the other side so let's do that now the part of the flight computer we're looking at then we're looking at the pressure altitude window and what we've done here is we've lined up our two degrees our plus two degrees above our pressure altitude of 5,000 feet so what is particular about pressure altitude well pressure altitude is is basically your altitude expressed as a flight level so on the pressure setting of 1013 hectopascals as they're called now hectopascals um, if you were flying on a, an altimeter setting of say for example uh, 1021 if you're flying at 5000 feet 1021 then you would need to work out your pressure altitude so you would need to find out what is 5000 feet 1021 translated to in terms of 5000 feet 1013 well as pressure decreases with height and 1013 is a lower pressure than 1021 um, it's going to be higher up in the atmosphere so it's going to be closer to us and that means that we're going to be uh, we're going to be indicating lower down on 1013 so if we work out the difference assuming 30 feet per millibar 1021 to 1013 is a difference of uh, 8 millibars 30 feet per millibar gives us a difference of 240 feet and like I said, we're going to be slightly closer to the 1013 datum than we were to the 1021 datum. So if we take that 240 feet off our 5,000, it's going to give us uh, 4,760 feet, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so if in a separate inst instance we were flying at 5,000 feet 1021, that would translate to 4,760 feet pressure altitude and that's the, that's the figure that we would try and line up underneath our two degrees. As it turns out for simplicity today I've planned it so that we're fl already flying on a pressure altitude of 5,000 feet so we don't need to worry about that. Um, so there we go 5,000 feet underneath the plus two and uh, now all we need to do is read off what our true airspeed is on the outside. Now the way I see this is our, our inside wheel shows us our our indication inside the cockpit and that's given us our 120 knots and our outside wheel shows us what's going on outside the aircraft and that's showing uh, just shy of 129 knots there we'll call it 129 for cash and we're going to take that and we're going to put the 129 knots into our true airspeed box next thing we're going to look at then is our true heading and again 
that's going to lead into our ground speed because they both feed off the same information which is the wind velocity that we we just got before back to the whiz wheel and we're going to flip it over this time and look at the wind side and i'm going to look at the two different methods of doing the drift calculating the drift there's the wind up method and the wind down method um, i think most people pick a preference depending on what what's personal to them i'll just quickly talk through both and the differences between the two and then it's up to you which one which one you want to choose later on down the line just a reminder of the wind on the right hand side there and then what you're going to do is you're going to set the wind for the wind up method you're going to set the wind in your whiz wheel so that your heading is 290 that's normal for both methods um, but with the wind up method in particular you're going to centralize your wheel on your wind speed of 25 knots there and you're going to draw your arrow up wind up method you're going to draw your arrow up to the datum and you're going to either draw a line or you can you can just mark a little cross like I tend to do. Then what you're going to do next is you're going to set your true track. So we calculated earlier on on the map that our true track was going to be 061. So I've set that on the outer on the on the inner wheel, sorry, underneath the index. Um, and I've moved the cross to our true airspeed that we've just calculated, which was 129 knots. So let's just take stock of where we're at at the moment we've got our true track of 160 of uh, 061 and we've got our true airspeed of um, uh, 129 and the arrow is pointing back and to the left so with the wind up method the arrow points upwind so it's pointing to where the wind is coming from if I turn to face that direction I'll have the wind in my face so what does that kind of mentally tell us about what's happened and what we're going to have to do about that? Well, if the wind's coming from the left, I need to turn left to lean into it. So we're going to expect to have a final um, true heading of less than less than 061. And how's that going to affect our speed? Well, if it's coming from behind me, it's going to push me on my way. So I'm going to expect my speed to be faster than uh, 129 knots. So... I I've noted there that we've got a drift correction that needs to be applied of 8 degrees uh, to port. So again, we're just looking at those uh, spokes that radiate out from the center of the datum and you can see that our cross is over a spoke that is on uh, on 8 degrees. So I'm going to need to turn left 8 degrees in order to counteract uh, the drift that, that's being applied to me. And we also know there that we can just read off where's our centre, where's the centre of our whiz wheel. It's over 145, so that tells me that my ground speed is 145 knots, and that actually ties in with what we were saying just a second ago. We are getting pushed along, so our ground speed is going to be faster than what our true air speed was was indicating. Now the thing with the wind up method is, it it, it ends there really. Your true heading is going to be uh, the result of you subtracting that 8 degrees because we need to turn left. So it's going to be a subtraction um, from our true track. And that's going to give us 053, which is our true heading. And then we can just read off the ground speed from the center of the of the whiz wheel of, of 145 knots. And the wind up method's finished in, in basically two, two uh, quick uh, maneuvers, if you like. So now let's have a look at the wind down method. It's slightly more convoluted, in my opinion, but um, I have to say when I started flying, I did prefer the wind down method. I, I think it was just because that was the method that was taught to me first and it stuck. Uh, so again, we're going to set the wind 290 uh, in the index again, same as before, but this time we're not going to put the center of the dot on our speed. We're going to put the center of our dot on our horizontal datum, uh, the center of our of our circular wheel, if you like. Uh, because now with the wind down method, we're going to draw the arrow down to the wind speed. So the arrow goes down to 25, and then we draw our little cross. So now what we do is we're going to set our true track again. We've got 0, 6, 1 underneath the index. And this time, we're going to put the center of the wheel on our true airspeed of 129 knots. And you remember before that we put the cross on the airspeed our true airspeed. Now we're going to put our center of our wheel on the true airspeed. And now we note that the arrow points forward and to the right. So what's that telling us? The arrow's pointing downwind on the wind down method. Uh, if we turn to face in the direction of the arrow, we've got the wind behind, the wind in our back, if you like. So 
What other information is it giving us? Well, it's telling us there that we've got about seven and a half degrees of starboard drift. So the last the last time with the wind up method, it was giving us an angle of drift correction. But with the wind down method, it's telling you your drift, how much you're drifting by. So we're drifting by seven and a half degrees starboard. Now the magnitude of the drift should be the same as the magnitude of the drift correction. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, cancel the seven and a half degrees starboard, and we're gonna turn seven and a half degrees to port. So I've turned the wheel around so that our our new uh, tr uh, true heading will be zero five three point five. So seven and a half degrees to the left of zero six one. But now if we look. Our, uh, our indicators just moved across further to 8.5 degrees starboard in total now. So by the by the nature of turning the wheel to correct for our previous drift, uh, it's actually showing a slightly different drift again now. So we need to account for that as well. Now we're not going to turn another 8.5 degrees because that would be too much. What we're going to do is we're going to match the total drift. So we've already turned 7.5 degrees to port. So we're just going to turn another 1 degree to port to, to match the 8.5 in total. And now if we look at what the indication is on the on the drift angle, it's it's stayed eight and a half degrees, you know, within it's within a quarter of a degree, isn't it really? So nothing too much to worry about. So now that then both match both of our um, our drift and our drift correction are equal, um we know that we're balanced and that's the way it should be. And we can stop we can stop the procedure right there. Now the beauty of the wind down method is we don't have to do any little bit of arithmetic at the end of that now. We can just read off the, the index. What is our true heading? Well, it says right there, it's 052.5. Uh, and what's our ground speed? Well, our ground speed is where our cross is, uh, reverse to the wind up method. And our cross is on the 144 knots. So our ground speed shown 144. So bringing that back to our chart then. As we've chosen to use both methods, we've got the benefit of looking at extra information. And we can see that there is a slight discrepancy. Uh, the wind up method's given us 053, the wind down method's given us 052.5, half a degree. If you can fly to within half a degree accuracy on that, then you're a better man or woman than I am. In fact, if you're if you're a woman at all, you're you're a better woman than I am. And looking at the ground speed, we've got 144 on one side versus 145. It doesn't really, one knot. It's not going to really change our lives. So I'm going to pick 145 because it's a nice round number. You notice that I've sneaked in 152.5, despite my comment on half a degree. And it's for simplicity later on. We'll come on to why I've chosen 152.5. Oh, sorry, 052.5 is our heading. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you choose, but I've just chosen it for simplicity later on. So next thing we're going to look at, while we've got the flight computer out, we'll do our final flight computer item. And that's to work out how, how long is it going to take us um, using the speed that we're going to be moving over the ground and using the distance we've got to fly over the ground how long is it going to take us to get from Shoreham to Lashenden? Calculating time then it's a it's a very simple speed distance time calculation and if you remember from school speed equals distance over time we're going to use the time index because anything relating to time on the on the flight computer will use the time index which for the arc 2 is the wide triangle with the 60 over 1 inside it so as speed is a rate of change of position with respect to time, we're going to use the time index. Uh, later on when we come to fuel consumption, it's a rate of change of fuel volume over time. We're going to use the time index. So we know that our speed over the ground is 145 knots. So we've lined that up with our index. And the next thing we need to do is really straightforward distance over time. So on the outer wheel, we're looking at our distance, which we know to be 40 miles and the time is given us a 16.6 minutes and if we were to do a you know a quick mental check of uh, round uh, rounding things up if our speed was 150 miles an hour and we had to fly 40 miles then you know a quarter of 150 is about 32 and a half so y you're looking at about f just over 15 minutes so that's a little just a little bit of a mental approximation there so anything anything massively different from 15 minutes, you know, if I get an hour, as a, if I take it as an hour and something, then I've gone wrong there. And that's what I like about the whiz wheel is it doesn't just give you the answer. Uh, it asks you to uh, to question it. It asks you to 
to, to, to work out the last little bit yourself, or, or you know, to work out this your starting point yourself and, and to, to interpret it properly. If you use a computer or a calculator, an electronic calculator, then they just ask us to accept the answer that we've been given, really, or, or we're taught, we're kind of um, mentally, um, how can I say it? We're mentally programmed, if you like, from school to just plug in the numbers and, and take out the answer that we've been given, which is wrong, really. We should always question the answer we've been given. But the ARC-2 flight computer or, or any flight computer, man, manual flight computer, it it forces you to to question it because it doesn't give you any decimal points. You know, you have to find out where the decimal point goes and you have to find out if the answer is roughly what you're expecting it to be. So it's good. It, it And we should do that in every aspect of flight planning, really. Um, when we're looking at obstructions and when we're looking at uh, routes and airspace and danger areas, you know, look for a reason why it shouldn't work rather than convincing yourself that it should work. And that's that should normally kind of uh, lead you down the right path in, in the long run. Okay, so back to this calculation then. We've got our speed of 145 knots. We've got our distance 40, and it's returning a time of 16.6 .6 minutes. So decimal, I don't have a decimal watch, so I convert that into, into seconds. 16 minutes, 36 seconds. And we can take that and pop that into our, our flight log. Next thing we're going to look at is our heading, our magnetic heading. And you can see that it's just a lookup item. So back to our chart, uh, and we're looking for this dashed blue line which shows a line of uh, of constant variation and uh, otherwise known as an isogonal as you're probably aware. If you scan up that line then you can see that there is a, a 1.5 degrees west indicator and that says everywhere on that line has got a variation of 1.5 degrees west. So the difference between true north and the difference between magnetic north is 1.5 to the west in that, in that case. And if you've read any any flying books at all then you'll know that west is best and east is least or if you've done any kind of land navigation i think it applies in land navigation as well uh, west is best and east is least so any variation to the west we're going to add and any variation to the east we need to take away well in the uk all our variation is to the west so we're going to take our, our true heading that we've just worked out previously on our flight computer uh, and we're going to add that one and a half degrees because it's to the west, and that's going to give us zero five four. So that's why I kind of cheated my way and used used zero five two point five earlier on because I knew that was going to get another half uh, another half degree increment, and it was going to make a nice round number at the end of it. So that zero five four goes into my magnetic heading, and that's the that's the heading I'm going to fly in the aircraft. Well, not quite because in the aircraft. Uh, we need to correct for deviation in order to give us our final compass heading. But the deviation is specific to individual aircraft and it's affected by things like uh, uh, the electronics in the aircraft. So uh, any effects by uh, large electrical piece of electrical equipment like radios or anything that's got you know a magnet in with like speakers or whatever. They're all going to create a magnetic field that's going to uh, you know deviate your your compass heading slightly. It's it's not going to be too much. Obviously, they're going to want to minimise that as much as possible in aircraft design. But it, to a degree, you know, it, it will it will exist. And each aircraft will have a little placard that will say what your uh, correction for deviation is, depending on what cardinal point you're flying at. So it's not something we can incorporate into our log at the moment. It's something that you're going to look at when you get into into your aircraft. So at the moment, we're, our magnetic heading is zero four five, and we're going to accept that as the, as the heading we're going to fly. 054. I think I just said 045. I meant 054. So finally, our ETA. What time were you going to arrive at our destination? Well, what time did we leave our departure? Today we're going to assume that we left uh, Shoreham at midday. And so, rounding that 16 minutes up to 17, we're going to arrive at 12.17. At now that's... That's obviously subject to a little bit of error. We're assuming today that we've we've flown over the top of Shoreham at flight level five zero with the correct winds and at 120 knots, and then we're going to finish over the top of Lashenden at flight level five zero with the correct winds at 120 knots, uh, indicated airspeed. Well, that's not the case. If if we take off from Shoreham when we land at Lashenden, then for the period of the climb from departure to flight level five zero. If we climb at 75 knots, then you know I'm going to be climbing for a good few minutes at a reduced airspeed. Uh, and likewise, when I come into land, 
uh, I'm going to reduce my speed and the winds are going to change as I descend through certain levels. So all these little differences are going to creep in to give us an error and over such a short flight that error is going to probably be quite significant. So, you know, for a bit of practice, if you wanted to, it might be worth splitting this leg up into uh, departure from Shoreham and your first leg is going to take you to the top of climb so you can work out what's your speed going to be in the climb and uh, how long is it going to take you. So a little bit of practice with the flight computer on how long it's going to take you to climb or given a specific uh, rate of climb to your to flight level 5.0. Uh, and then you can make that leg one and then once you reach the top of climb you can do a second leg which takes you to the top of descent which will look like similar to, to the details we've got in front of us now um, obviously except the distance will be different. Um, and then after that you can go from your top of descent to your touchdown and again, you can look at what your speed going to be in the descent, how long you're going to be descended for, and that could be a third leg. So over such a short flight, you know, the error is going to be significant. But today we're going to simplify all of that and we're going to say um, we're going to start and finish over our points uh, at flight level 50 at the right speed and it's going gonna, it's gonna to all work out the way you want it to. Another way to do that, I suppose, would be to take off from Shoreham and uh, climb in the overhead to flight level 50 and then start your navigation leg uh, so you can time it in the overhead once you've reached there you can discount the spiral climb and then you can do the same at the other end you can you can stop the clock over Lashenden and then you can start to configure yourself for landing interestingly the magnetic variation that we've just added on to our to our true heading uh, I, I naively assumed that it will be straight lines from the north magnetic pole to the south magnetic pole similar to lines of longitude but looking at this this um, declination chart or you know field declination chart from 2010 they go all over the place so there's obviously a lot of complicated um, factors going on inside the earth's core there or something or to do with the the composition of the earth or or maybe I don't know cosmic effects would that cosmic winds affect that you know would it how much would it vary by over time I have no idea but um, it's it's quite interesting to know that I thought and yeah there you go on that map uh, the the green lines are lines of constant zero degree variation and they've got a specific name and I can't remember what that's called but I'm sure someone will, will help me out there those green lines zero degree variation and then to the, the blue anything blue is west variation anything green uh, red is east sorry so that's just a little indication of an indication of what what's going on on the planet as a whole quite interesting but not relevant to our flight so don't worry about it just a smaller side there okay the vfr flight look then so we've finished that portion uh, i've brought back into play our from and two we know we're going from and two and our actual time of arrival well that remains to be confirmed so now we're going to plan our fuel. First things first, in your flight manual it will tell you what your unusable fuel is. For the PA-28, uh, the particular type I'm, I'm going to use, we're going to have 7.6 litres of unusable fuel. And that's going to probably gather all the nasties in the bottom of the tank to make sure that they don't find their way into the engine at all. Uh, you'll notice that I'm using litres and uh, when it, when I move across to mass and balance I'm going to use kilograms. And the reason I'm not using imperial gallons and or U US gallons and uh, pounds is because it's the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen. You know, uh, I, why aren't I writing in Roman numerals? Because we've moved on. Uh, so there you go, that's my small rant over there. So unusable fuel, 7.6 litres. Our reserve fuel I've picked an arbitrary 35 litres and I've based that on an hour's flying. So I know the fuel consumption for my aircraft type uh, under the conditions I'm going to fly in will be 35 litres an hour. And so I'm going to allow for an extra hour's flying beyond that. That will allow me to get to my alternate airfield if the weather closes in or if my destination becomes unable to accept me because it's runways blocked or they've, they've got some kind of uh, unserviceability on the airfield. So I'm planning for a reserve of, of an hour's flying time. So now we just need to work out how, how much fuel do we need for our trip in particular. Well, we know how long we're flying for. We're flying for uh, 16 minutes and 36 seconds. So let's get back to the whiz wheel. This is a time-based calculation, like I said before. So we're going to use the time index. Uh, fuel consumption is the rate of change of fuel over time. So 35 litres um, per unit hour, if you like. And... Uh, on the outside, we're going to put 
we're going to find how much fuel we've used by lining it up by the time that we're going to fly for or the time we're going to spend using that fuel on the inside so we're going to we're going to suck that fuel away for 16.6 minutes and uh, a rough calculation says well what's 16 minutes um, or rather if we're using th uh, 35 liters in one hour how much will I use in about a quarter of an hour well I use about a quarter of 35 well I can make that simpler what's a quarter of 40 a quarter of 40 is 10 35 is less than 10 uh, <laughs> that was just, what am I saying a <laughs> uh, let me just rewind that for a second we're using <laughs> 35 is less than 10 ladies and gentlemen so uh, you know use that in your flight planning that'll get you far uh, we're going to go for a quarter of an hour uh, what's a quarter of 35? Well, uh, 35 is less than 40. A quarter of 40 is 10. So we're looking at something less than less than 10. Uh, again, the whiz wheel is going to require us to apply a little bit of thought. So uh, hopefully better thought than I've just applied there for most of you guys. So there you go. Uh, we've got an indication on the, on the outside of the wheel that says uh, 95, 96, 96.5 it looks like. And again, you know, it's not really 96.5. It's going to be 9.65. Because, like we said a second ago, it's going to be less than 10. 9.65 sounds good to me. And that's our volume in litres. So going back to our table then, I'm going to round that up to 9.7. And uh, if we tally up to get our total, we end up with 52.3 litres on the whole. Now, uh, taxiing, power checks, any delays on the ground, I'm going to add an extra 10% to that. And I'm going to round it up to 58 litres. So now we know our total fuel volume in terms of litres, we can go on to our mass and balance. So the mass and balance information we found in the aircraft tech log, so have a look at that and you'll get given a load of information for free. First things first, the aircraft's basic weight is in this case 694 kilograms. And I know the lever arm for that is uh, 2.24 metres because it says so in the tech log and that gives us a total moment of uh, 1,555 kilogram meters. I don't need to work that out. That's all laid down. That's basic and it, it won't change until the aircraft next uh, faces its way in with the engineers, whenever that may be. So so that's fixed. We can just write that down. Now we've got some variables that we do need to consider. One of them is how many people are on board and where do they sit? So uh, as the pilot flying, you're, you're going to be sat in the front, in the front row of your PA-28 and you may or may not have an, an instructor or a passenger with you. So I'm going to take the combined weight of the pilot and the instructor or passenger as 150 kilograms. So we can read off in the tech log what the lever arm is for that and uh, we need to work out the moment. How do we do that then? Does every anybody have any questions on that? Everybody happy? Right, uh, that was just a bit of a joke. All it is, all we will do is we'll get the kilograms, the mass in kilograms, and we'll multiply it by the lever arm. So 150 kilograms... Uh, multiplied by 2.04 and that's going to give us uh, a moment of 306 kilogram meters so it's just force uh, the force is the mass times the distance basically that's uh, it's GCSE type stuff and now for the back row today I'm not going to have any passengers in the back so that's going to be zero and so the moment about that datum or about that lever arm is going to be zero baggage we're going to carry 20 uh, kilograms of cheap crisps and fizzy pop and they're going to be in the baggage compartment which has got a lever arm of 3.63 multiply those two figures together and our moment 73 kilogram meters and then finally our fuel now the fuel is probably the trickiest part of the mass and balance calculation because the rest of it we just we do a simple multiplication but the fuel we need to convert from liters into kilograms so we can't just say 58 liters because 58 liters doesn't weigh 58 kilograms. Um, 58 litres of water would weigh 58 kilograms, but 58 litres of fuel um, doesn't weigh 58 kilograms. F fuel weighs uh, different from water. And that's that, that's uh, called the specific gravity of the fuel. So specific gravity is a factor relative to the same volume of water. How much does the same volume of fuel weigh? And it turns out that for Avgas, uh, the the factor is is 0.72, so a liter of fuel will weigh 72% of what a liter of water will weigh. 
So if a litre of water weighs a kilogram, a litre of fuel will weigh 720 grams, if you like. So that, that automatically now allows us to start to um, come up with a rough figure for what we're expecting our fuel weight to be. So first of all, if it's 0.72, we know that it's going to be less than um, its weight in kilograms. So, uh, sorry, the equivalent weight of water in kilograms. So 58 litres of water will weigh 58 kilograms. So 58 litres of fuel is going to weigh less than 58 kilograms for starters. That's our very rough estimate as, as a starter for 10. And 72% 70, is, is not near enough three quarters. So if we say three quarters of 60 is uh, 45, so 72% is less than three quarters. So it's going to be slightly less than 45 kilograms. That's, our, that's, our, that's my mentality in kind of approaching this problem just from the outset. So this is a non-time based calculation. We're just simply looking at weights and measures now. So we're going to line up our 58 liters underneath the liter indicator on the outside of the of the whiz wheel that's our start next thing we're going to do is we're going to move to the to the kilograms specific gravity arc now to the bottom of the screen you can see there's a pound specific gravity arc as well but we want our weight in kilograms today for reasons that i've already mentioned and uh, we know that specific gravity of our particular fuel is 0.72 so on the outside wheel we're going to line up 72 if you like or 0.72 if you want to put in the decimal place and then we're going to read off the inside of what it says so it, there it's given us an indication of four, just under 42 and that's what we said didn't we, we our rough estimate said it's going to be less than 45 and we, we're showing 42 there uh, as, as near as makes no difference anyway so we'll take that as 42 it's always better to round up because you know at, at least if you round up your error on the side of, of safety with everything that we do so there you go, 42 kilograms, and we're going to take that back to our mass and balance sheet and pop that in there. A sim again, the simple multiplication, 42 multiplied by that particular lever arm, is going to give us a, a total fuel moment of 102 kilogram meters. So what do we do with all these bits of information now? Is it safe to fly? Well, there's just one, one more step really, and then we're, we're almost there. So bringing in our totals. The total mass is obviously the sum of all the masses. So the total mass of the aircraft is is everything involved added together. And that's going to give us a total mass of 906 kilograms today. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe not so obviously. The total moment is going to be the sum of all moments. So we'll add those up. And that'll give us 2,036 kilogram meters. And uh, maybe maybe not obviously at all to some people is the total lever is going to be the total moment divided by the total mass. So that's going to be 2036 divided by 906. And that's going to give us 2.25. And that looks roughly, you know, it looks about right. It's not 10 or it's not 0 0.3. It fits with the rest of the lever arms roughly, doesn't it? So we're happy that those figures look like they should. Like they should. And the, total, the reason that it's the total mass divided by the, sorry, the total moment divided by the total mass is just a reverse calculation of what we've been doing. We've previously been multiplying the mass by the lever to give us the moment. And now we've just undone that and divided um, the mass by the moment to return the lever, if you like. It, it's, it's just a triangle of velocity type calculation from before. So once we've got those three bits of information, we're going to then take them back to the tech log and find out if we're safe to do what we need to do. In the mass and balance page, then you're gonna you could get one um, of two graphs, or if you're lucky, you might get both. I think you'll probably just get one. On the uh, on the left hand side, you've got the you've got a flight envelope that shows you a utility category and a normal category. Now, the utility category exists within the normal category, and uh, if you're <coughs> you could be in the normal category to fly, and uh, and not in the utility category to fly, in which case you can't fly utility category flights. You you'll know you'll know what your category of flight is before you before you go. So if you if you're in the utility category, you're automatically in the normal category. It's kind of more stringent restrictions, if you like. So what we do with that then is we we get our we get our total mass on the uh, on the y-axis, nine hundred six kilograms. And we draw a horizontal line. And where, d where does the horizontal line stop? Well, it stops when it meets the vertical line that comes up from our lever arm. 
So our total lever arm, which was 2.25, and we're going to draw that up. The reason I don't have any scales uh, on these charts is I, I deleted them because they were written in they were written in, in Roman numerals, so I've gotten rid of them because the scales were all in different units, and so I didn't want to confuse the situation. So for the purposes of just demonstration, we'll assume that the, the horizontal red line is is uh, coming out from 906 kilograms, and the vertical red line is, is coming up from 2.25 meters. Now they've both met in a normal category envelope, which means that we're okay to do a normal category flight. Uh, if we wanted to do a utility category, then <coughs> we'd have to we'd have to um, reconfigure our aircraft load, consider uh, dumping a passenger, dropping off some bags maybe. Um, but at the moment we're, we're good in terms of our flight in that respect. Now the the graph on the right hand side is, is slightly more helpful because all we need for that is the aircraft weight and the, the total moment. The graph will do the calculation for us in terms of the lever arm that we did previously. So it looks a little bit ski whiff compared to the the graph on the left but that's just because it's incorporating that extra little division in order to to apply the lever arm calculation so here we're going to put again we're going to put the loaded aircraft weight in 906 from the left and that's going to uh, go horizontally until it meets uh, the mom the total moment from the bottom of uh, 2036 And uh, if they meet, in this case, again, we're in a normal category, so we're good for a normal flight. If we needed to uh, go to the utility category, you can see they would probably need to slide left. So we need to reduce the aircraft moment. Maybe, I don't know, maybe put the bags from the baggage compartment into the rear, onto the rear seats. Maybe that would help. I don't know. Probably worth a try. Um, and that might kind of bring the total aircraft moment forward a little bit closer to the datum and just drag us to the left into that utility category. So the you know there are various ways to skin a cat, and I think it's quite important as well to note that you can't just load up. It, it's quite clear in in all the manuals. You can't just load up your aircraft with passengers and fuel and think it's good to fly. You know you can. It's not it's not like a car. You can't just sit f sit five people in a car, put fill the boot with bags, and then drive away. Um, you ac every we accept that in a car you can do that, uh, but in an aircraft it's not the case. It's really easy to fill your fuel tanks up, put your bags in four passengers in and you are well outside the the envelope for, for safe flight and as soon as you take off you, you know you're gonna have problems with your center of gravity probably um, difficulty climbing away st sat on the back of the drag curve maybe um, center of gravity difficult to trim all kinds of issues so definitely definitely do your mass and balance calculations and make sure that your aircraft is in the category that you need it to, to be in before you start your flight otherwise you're you're heading for disaster really so that we're pretty much there now we've you know we've planned our leg we've planned our fuel we know how much we need we've planned our mass and balance we're safe we're in the right category uh, so we're good to go flying but I do th I think it's worth just covering a final couple of hints and tips before we call it a day uh, on our particular leg today what what can we what can we use around us to help us to make sure that we we stick on the right track well we've got loads of VOR DMEs uh, on this particular leg and I know it's not an IFR flight it is it's VFR we're using the ground we're navigating by terrain we're staying outside of the cloud but you know the the weather can catch us out but not only that we can occasionally become say temporarily unsure of our position so what you could do is and what I would do just for an example is uh, in the VFR flight guide, uh, it says that Lashenden is on the 170 radial from Detling at a range of uh, 9 miles, I think it says. So what you could do is you could set into your VOR, into your Navigation 1 computer, or your Nav 1 radio. If you set the Detling frequency of 117.3 and set the radial to 171, uh, don't worry about the range, just use that as a wall. When that needle goes through the middle of your of your dial, you know you've gone too far. It, and it, it's kind of just a little safety blanket. You know, if you're starting to think, I should be there by now, I should be there by now. Well, if you're still on the right side of the of the needle indicator, then you, you know you're not there yet. It's really easy to, to convince yourself uh, that you've, you know, you should be there, you've gone too far. Especially uh, you start to panic more and more and uh, it all starts to spiral out of control. So that can just be a little... A little hard deck, if you like, a little lateral hard deck, a little place where you know if I've if that needle transits through, I've gone too far. Um, but it shouldn't be a problem for this flight today because 
Shoreham and Lashingdon both have NDB or NDBs. So you can just tune the Lashingdon NDB and uh, make sure that your relative bearing indicator is pointing in the right direction. Again, you're not going to fly just solely using the relative bearing indicator because it is a VFR flight. You're going to be following the the uh, geographical features underneath you. And it is worth noting that you know the RBI is subject to errors like re coastal refraction, for example, um, and it will point towards a thunderstorm quite nicely and take you straight to the scene of your demise if you're not careful. And also, the, the RBI doesn't uh, account for wind drift either. So if you've got your wind calculation wrong, um, don't just fly straight down your relative bearing indicator because you'll probably end up just flying a, a spiral straight to your destination if the wind was particularly strong. Yeah, it's just one of those things. Uh, is it roughly pointing in the right direction? Yes, it is. I'm heading in the right direction. You know, if you look down and suddenly your your Lashington RBI is pointing behind you, then in that case, yeah, you, you've probably you've probably gone too far. And then finally, then uh, I noticed this on our track. We've got uh, some kind of bird sanctuary there or or wildlife um, area. So. Particularly on climb out from Shoreham today, you'd want to try and avoid that if you can, up to the dimensions that it specifies. But give it a wide berth because, you know, you, you want to look after the local environment, you want to look after nature. And if there are any grumpy people who live nearby you who look for any excuse to write off to the to the CAA or your, your local aviation authority to complain about the flying and, and build up a case to get you closed down, you know, don't give them the ammunition to do that. And more than that, it's not just about uh, giving people ammunition um, just respect your neighbors really you know if there's a built-up area that you can avoid flying low over then by all means do that there's no need to to go waxing it over villages and and hamlets just uh, give them a wide berth and, and treat your neighbors with respect and then they'll hopefully uh, allow you to to continue flying for many years to come i think that's it really i, I mean I, I hope i've covered everything i've, I've jabbered on a little bit if there's any questions, if you'd like me to do any particular videos, or if you think I've, I've made a mistake or got something wrong, then uh, it's highly likely. So please do let me know, and, and I'll try and correct it for next time. Or I'll try and do some kind of revision or, or add an annotation if I am if I can work out how to do that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all there is for me to say, really. I uh, hope that's helped. Enjoy flying out there. And uh, as always, thanks very much for watching.